Okay. My name is Marshall Clow. I am a, a software developer. I've been writing software for a long time. I think I figured it out that last year was 40 years since I got my first paid software job. Um, I have done a bunch of stuff. I was, um, uh, I've been involved with Boost for 20 something years. Um, I was the lead developer on libc++, the standard library implementation for LLVM for nine years. I was the uh, chairman of the library working group on the standards committee. Um, and so under my watch, we shipped three, C++ 17 and C++ 20. Uh, this talk is about um, things around the code. This will not be a code heavy talk. This is going to be about strategies for um, improving your code, improving your product as it were. Um, I'm going to use in this talk, I'm going to use the term library for a shorthand for a piece of code because a lot of it's going to be, you're producing a library you want people to use. But most of the advice is not particular to a library. I'm just going to use that as a shorthand. Um, I'm not going to talk about things like marketing. I'm not going to talk about distribution. I'm not going to talk about search engine optimization. I'm not going to talk about um, social media. I'm going to talk about things around the code. If you have questions along the way, please put your hands up and I'll try to answer them right away. Occasionally I will answer a question with, hold on to that thought, I have a slide coming up on it, but most of them I will answer right away. For those of you who are at the top of the, the auditorium, you may have to wave your hands rather vigorously. Um, the spotlights that are shining on me are actually pretty high and pretty bright. So um, I can see about up to about two, la two um, rows from the top. Okay, let's get started. So um, first thing you want to have, documentation. Um, everybody slags on documentation. Lots of documentation out there is, is not particularly good. Some of it is downright bad. Some of it is better. But you need it. Okay? If somebody is looking for your library and they search for it on pick your search engine and it comes up, what's the first thing they're going to do? They're going to look at the documentation and they're going to evaluate your library based on the documentation. And if your documentation is clearly slapdash or you know, an afterthought or something like that, they may just close the browser window and go on to the next hit in Bing, Google, whatever. Um, and suddenly you've lost a potential user. Um, you know what your library does, isn't that enough? Well, no, it's not. And don't you get tired of explaining it to people over and over and over again? That's the purpose of the documentation. You explain it to people once, and then you can point people at the documentation. Um, yeah, you, the, the old comment is you never get another chance to make a first impression. Your documentation is your first impression. Um, I used to work with a guy named Steve Dorner who worked on a, uh, who wrote a email client called Eudora. Um, this was a long time ago. But if you sent an email to Steve asking a question about some feature of Eudora, more likely than not, you would get an, a one line answer back, which was a link to a, piece, a particular paragraph in the documentation. Um, your documentation can, in fact, save you time, save you effort. You know, if you have good documentation, some percentage of your users will go look in the documentation rather than pestering you, and that's a nice thing. And some percentage of, your, of the questions you get, you can answer immediately. But let's talk about what kind of documentation you might want to have. I said, I said in here, should you have? These, that's a question you should answer. Should you have what kind of documentation? But I'm going, to give, I'm going to name five categories, and you can think about which, which of these apply to your situation. Maybe all of them. Maybe none of them. Maybe you're in some unique situation where it's not a problem. Um, an overview. An overview is you know, basically, what does this library do? You, know, you want somebody who's looking for something that does you know, animation of faces given a picture, and you say, well, I do fast Fourier transforms. That's enough. It's like, this is not the library for me. Right? Or I calculate, you know, 
numeric coefficients for something, something. Okay, fine, that's not for me. But you want to give an idea of what you do, an overview. Um, next one up. Getting started. How do I install your, my library? How do you install my library? How, where do I get it? Can I get it from a package manager? Can I get it from um, SourceForge? Can I get it from GitHub? Can I get it from wherever? The people at Conan will happily, you know, happily help you set stuff up so you can get it from them or from you know, various places. But the people need to know how to get your library. That should be mentioned in your documentation rather prominently. How do I get this? The next step is getting started. I'm um, sorry, getting started. I said, back up. Getting started is part, part of it is how do I get it, but then also get, how to get it installed. Um, how do you get it installed? How do you get it built? If it's a kind of library that's not header only, you know, a lot of C++ libraries are header only, but if, uh, if yours is not, how do you build it? How do you, um, how do you make sure that it's usable? Um, examples are good. Um, simple examples, right? How do you, some things you can use to, um, to show people the power of your library. Um, after that, we go on to tutorials. You know, examples draw people in, make it so that they're interested in your library. Oh, this is cool. Tutorials show them how to do more extensive things. I want to do, I want to create a, a simple web server. That's a tutorial you, to, to, if you're a networking library, say, or an HTTP library. Um, and the last one of these is reference. What do all the calls do? You know, what are all the calls? What do the parameters to each of the calls mean? How do they affect the performance? Um, these are basic, basic, basic kinds of documentation. And um, which ones work for you is the question. I'm not, I'm not saying that everybody has to have these. What I'm saying is that you want to have, you want to think about whether or not you need these. Okay. Any questions about documentation? I can't see your hands. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Um, what's the difference between examples and tutorials? Um, a, an example is kind of like a getting started kind of thing. This is a simple thing you can do with a, with a library. Um, a tutorial is maybe something more in depth. You know, something. An example is like. You know, here's how you could build a, a very simple program, almost a toy program, but it shows off the kind of things the library can do. A tutorial is more of, this is maybe something more substantial, something useful you could do. It's a matter of degree. It's, there's not really a lot of hard and fast boundaries there. Yeah, I have a comment. Yes. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'm pro documentation. I probably document too much. But now you are uh, putting a list of things that people want to market themselves, want to somehow sell their library. Yes. Most of the people here, they write code mm -hmm. internally. OK. And I'm guessing half the people here at least don't document at all. <laughs> and the managers don't even. And the teammates with the code review don't do either. What can, it, what can you say to them? Well, for people who are writing internally, um, I believe that documentation, writing documentation, at least reference documentation, is, is a self-defense mechanism. Um, because if you write reference documentation, you get fewer people calling you and asking you, how does this work? Or how do I use this? Or so on. And you can point at them and say, this is how you use it. This is, um, and also, and it's going to come up again with, with tests later, um, people, it gives people an idea what they can expect. You know, if you just give them a prototype, you know, int foo takes a bunch of parameters, they're going to wonder, what does foo do? The documentation tells you that. Is this something I want it to do? Um, yes, I, I, I um, couch this in terms of selling, but it's not really a selling thing. It's informing your users, trying to help your users use your library, as opposed to a, you know, a commercial transaction. But yeah, there's some of that in there. Other questions? Yeah, thanks. Bugs works as coding. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The the comment was is if you don't have any documentation, you don't have any bugs because the the program the library works as it works. This is true, but not helpful. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Some people talk about setting up unit tests as, and so on as part of the documentation. Hang on to that for a sec. I think, whoops, sorry. You're going to have to wait maybe like four or five slides. I thought it was the next slide, but no, it's like four or five up there. Um, way in the back. So the question is, should you put in your documentation problems that you have, maybe known bugs or future directions, places where you want to go? Yes, I believe so. There are, there, there are several places you could do that, but documentation is, is definitely one of them. Um, at the end of this talk, I'm going to talk about release notes and things like that, and you can put future directions in there. But that doesn't mean you can't put them in the documentation. You can say, you know, a future version of this library in the future version of this library, I intend to do this and this and this. Because that also gives people a, a heads up that changes are coming down the road. Right here? Here. <laughs> OK. So would you say that points one and four is more like a VB area, and point number five is a Doxygen, or is a way of doing this? Um, so I really like Doxygen for generating reference, reference documentation. OK? Um, it's nice because it takes the, you can have the, uh, the Doxygen comments right next to the code, and it gets auto-generated. Um, but so yes, 0.5 reference documentation um, is, is a good use of Doxygen. The, the tutorials tend to be more of, here's a chunk of code that uses the library, with, and then you explain it. And I've never used Doxygen for that, so I don't know if Doxygen supports that kind of um, code decoration, code documentation. OK. Let's move on to tests, because I really like tests. Um, you should have tests, not because people say you should have Not since I say you should have tests, not because people say, well, where's your test? Because it helps you, OK? It helps you in many, many ways. It helps you make sure that you fixed a bug. When you get a bug and you write a test, you put it in your test suite, if that bug ever comes back, your tests fail. OK? You can catch regressions. You can say, this used to work, and now it doesn't. Um, you can, in fact, pinpoint problems. Um, in somebody's installation by having them run tests. You can um, peop help people um, port stuff, to port your library to a new platform. You know, how, does, how well does it work? Um, run the tests and tell me what, what succeeds and what fails. Um, I used to, ha I, well, I still talk about, um, I used to work in companies which practice what I call fear-based programming. Fear-based programming is the simplest way to explain it is, Oh, we can't change that. It might break something. I'm afraid it might break something. Yes. Well, we. <laughs> I saw somebody turn around and look at one of their coworkers like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a good test suite, you don't ever have to do that. You, you make a change. You run your tests. And if nothing breaks, you didn't break anything. Now, the. The prerequisite of that is having a test suite which you're, you are confident in that is good enough. And that's work. Don't get me wrong. That's a lot of work. But um, just to give you an example, when I was uh, committing new features to libc++, I, I used to do a, just a quick um, test, you know, a quick line count to see what the ratio of actual code I was committing to tests. And it tended to average about 10 to 1. When I committed span to libc++, for example, 600 lines of code, 6,000 lines of tests. Now, the standard library is a special case. I have a written spec. Okay, people expect it. This will do this. You know that the data, 
the member called data on a span will return a pointer to the element type and will be no except. Right? I have to write tests for that to make sure that my implementation is compliant. But when you, you, know, when you write tests, um, you know, think about what things that you expect people to depend on. What things are you promising to your users? And that's where you write tests. Uh, I was talking to Mike Spertus, who was giving a talk this afternoon, um, earlier this week, and he said that um, one of a now I can't remember the name of it, one of the, the SQL database pro, open source des, database programs, or not programs, but libraries that you can use, and I don't remember the name, they had a ratio of 253 to 1 in terms of lines of test code to actual lines of code. That's just a huge number. OK. A good test suite is what? Easy to run. It should be really easy to run. If your test suite takes overnight to run, you're not going to run it very often. If your test suite takes five minutes to run, you're going to run it a lot. It, it's the kind of thing where you say, I need a cup of coffee. I'm going to run the test suite. Go get a cup of coffee. <laughs> or, you know, oh, it's time for lunch. I'll run the test suite. I'll test the changes I've made in the last hour. Um, always green. Always, always green. If you do not keep your test suite green, you'll lose interest in it. If you, if you have failures in your test suite and you don't like jump on them and address them and make sure it's green, pretty soon it won't matter because um, nobody will care about the test results. There are a whole bunch of things in, um, in software development that you, know, you, can, you can count in metrics and you get some number and you can start measuring them if they go up or down. But many of them, it's much easier to drive them to zero and just make sure they stay at zero. Okay? Number of test failures, zero. Should be zero, zero. If, your test, if you have a test which is occasionally failing, you should figure out why it's occasionally failing and fix it. Chances are that you have something um, inconsistent in your test. People have bugs in their tests. But Find it and fix it and make it reproducible. Make it either fail all the time or never. Figure out which one it should be. And if it's failing all the time, well, now you have a bug in your library and you should fix that. If it's a failing, if it should fail never, then you have a bug in your test and fix that. Um, another example of that, by the way, not so much about this, is compiler warnings. If you build your library and it sits out 100 compiler warnings every single time, you'll never look at any of them. And if it suddenly, you suddenly have 105 compiler warnings, you'll never, ever notice. But if you drive, spend the effort and drive that to zero, and, it, and you have no warnings, no warnings, no warnings, no warnings, and suddenly you have five, well, that's a change that you'll see, you'll notice. And then you can drive it back to zero. And it's much easier to keep it at zero than to get to zero. OK, always green, comprehensive. Um, in an ideal world, which we don't really live in, but in an ideal world, your question, somebody says, is your code ready to release? Your, your response should be, does it pass the tests? If the answer is yes, then your answer is yes. Okay, if your test suite is comprehensive, that's all you need to know. Yes, it passes all the tests. Um, you should run it often, preferably on every change. Um, depends on how long it takes. The shorter, the shorter your turnaround is, the more often you can run it. You should certainly run it at least on every commit. Um, and when, when I do stuff, I run tests, I run a bunch of stuff before every commit, you know, before I actually commit stuff. Um, my current, my current um, consulting client runs, has code running on eight or ten different kinds of machines. And so I run it on one or two or three before I commit it. And then every now and then I get a note that, you know, I get it an email back that said, oh, this built failed on Sun OS something or other. <laughs> but run often, easy to automate. You really, really want your test to be automated. Continuous integration is a great thing. Um, the fact that CPU cycles are almost free is a wonderful thing. Um, you, can, you can afford to run 
your tests over and over and over again. Um, a long time ago, they were not free. Um, tests is, um, going back to documentation, you should document how people, how to run your test suite, because other people will want to do it. And you want, you know, if somebody takes your library and puts it on, you know, you, you built this on Linux and somebody says, I want to run it on Windows, you say, this is how you run the test suite. And then you can see how well, um, how well your library works on a different system. And usually, um, usually your tests will show that, you know, if somebody takes it to an altogether different system, you'll show the places where you've made assumptions about your platform and find, makes it easier to debug it. And this is great when you don't have access to the system. Anyway, um, OK, you asked about running tests um, and documentation earlier. Boost, a, library, a collection of libraries that I work on, if you read the Boost documentation, it has a couple of question and answer, frequently asked questions. Question, how do you run the Boost regression tests, it says. It has two sections here. To run the library's regression test, runs Boost B2 utility from that directory, from, the, from that particular library's directory, from li the particular library's test directory, excuse me. OK, and it says to run every library test, run it from this directory. So here we have documentation and tests for the win. Um, and a lot of times, you know, people say, I'm now, I've installed Boost on my XYZ system with compiler PDQ version 1, 2, 3, 4, and my program isn't working, and it's not working with this particular Boost library. And so one of the questions is, what happens when you run the tests? And frequently the answer is, there's an installation problem. There's, there's some component that's missing, and the tests will pinpoint that. OK, any question about tests? I could talk all day about tests. Yes, Victor. protocols you have established for your functions. Mm -hmm. How would you recommend dealing with uh, when performance is part of the contract? Like figuring out semantically does what it should be, mm -hmm. but you have a performance regression. So would that be part of the test? So the question is how do you how do you test for basically for performance regressions? And um, It depends on how you want to define performance. Um, I'll give you an example, OK? And it probably won't be wholly satisfactory for you. STD sort in or make heap in, you know, used in the priority queue in the standard library. It talks about making a heap. It talks about it moves things around. And it says, will perform mo no more than this many swaps or this many comparisons. And the way you deal with that is you write a comparator and you write an object that, uh, a class that, among other things, counts the number of times swap is called, counts the number of times the comparison is called, and you verify that, in fact, you meet those performance criteria. The part about time, time is harder because all sorts of things can affect that. You know, if the, test, the machine you're running your regression tests on is under heavy load, you may not, you know, you, you may discover that your tests take longer to run. If for some reason you, you know, your code is not getting loaded on a cache line, yeah, that can add catastrophic tests. But in general, um, it comes back to what do you want, what are you trying to achieve here? If you're trying to achieve, you know, minimum number of operations, you can instrument those. Time is harder, you know, and I don't have a great answer for that. Yes, right in the center. How do you measure comprehensiveness? Is it only code coverage or other types of coverage? Um, I have a little bit later on tools, and I mentioned code coverage tools. The question is, how do you measure comprehensiveness? And that's kind of a judgment call. Um, you, can, you can use code coverage tools to get an idea if, in fact, all of the, all of the lines of code or most of the lines of code do, um, are exercised by your test suite. And that's a good idea. But that's probably not sufficient, and it's not necessary to hit like every single line. 
there are some lines that it's like, oh, I don't know how to do this race condition here. <laughs> um, but you want to make sure that all of the, the entry points are tested and all of the test cases that are, all the cases that are documented are tested and that some, as many of the error conditions that, you want, that you're willing to write code for hit. I mean, the thing is, is that really writing a test suite, there's a whole, that's a hole with no bottom. You could spend your rest of your life writing a test suite. And so you have to use your judgment to decide what is sufficient. Um, but code coverage tools are a great place to get an idea. I mean, I have used those a lot to look at, you know, look at one or two files and say, oh my goodness, look, this, these four routines here are not being, not being exercised by our test suite and add more tests. Okay. Yay. Um, I've been writing software a long time. And one of the, the really, really nice things about um, the last 25 years is the tools have gotten way better. So I'm going to talk about tools in general that you can use to help improve your code. Okay? Compilers. Compilers are like your first line of defense. Um, compilers will reject um, illegal code. They'll warn on questionable code. Um, they suggest things where it might be ill-formed. You should pay attention to these. Compilers are not always right, um, but they're right more often than they're not. Static analyzers. Um, static analyzers, there's a whole bunch of static analyzers. Every compiler has a static analyzer in it because that's how it generates warnings. Um, there are commercial static analyzers like Clockwork and Coverity and so on. Um, those, I've used those. They find amazing things. They're also very, very heavyweight and they cost a fair amount of money. There are static analyzers that are um, not, well, that are open source. Um, Clang Tidy is a great example of that. How many people here are familiar with Clang Tidy? Great. I have an example of, Clang, of a Clang Tidy checker in a little bit. Um, the uh, GSL guidelines from Microsoft, the GSL guidelines checker, another great, great example. Um, dynamic analyzers, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about those in a bit. Um, code coverage tools, you mentioned code coverage tools, and fuzzers. Um, yeah. So here's examples of compiler warnings. Um, compiler warnings, the first one of these, right? Val is some expression. If val is lettuce that int min here for, for the purposes of slideware, I'm using int min in, instead of the modern shiny C thing, which is stood numeric limits int colon colon min open friend close friend, because that won't fit on the slide. Um, who can tell me what the compiler will warn on that first chunk of code? Sorry? Unreachable? Unreachable? Sure, why not? Um, the, um, the, my compiler says, this is, this is always false. That's what it says. It doesn't say the code is unreachable. It says this comparison is always false. Or this is a tautological comparison or something like that. But that the code inside the brackets is unreachable is certainly a valid warning. Yes. Because an int cannot ever be less than int min. Right. Um, this second one, if A equals B, then stuff. This is a very common error. Chances are pretty darn good that the person who wrote it meant to say A equals equals B. And sometimes the compiler is just being dumb. This one, standard make unique unsigned care zero. Um, there is a, a very well-known popular compiler out there that will warn on this line of code. It will say that converting from an int zero to an unsigned care involves truncation and it may change your value. I like the warning, I like the idea of the warning, but the compiler has completely missed the fact that this is a literal zero. And there's no truncation when you go from zero to zero. Zero int and zero int. If this was, you know, if I wrote extern int i and put i there, the compiler had no idea what the value of i was. 
I would be really happy with that error, or that warning, I should say. But when it's a literal zero, it, that makes people roll their eyes and say, no. OK, static analysis, I talked a little bit about that. Um, Covarity, Fortify, Clockwork. LLVM has a standard, has a framework and a tool for Clang Tidy. This is my favorite Clang Tidy checker. It's a silly little checker, but it's, it's an example of the kind of things you could do with Clang Tidy. You have a, a function named foo, right? It takes an int and a double, and you call it with a double and an int. <coughs> this is perfectly legal code. The compiler will generate an implicit, whoops, sorry an implicit conversion from a double to an int, and from an int to a double, and call foo. This is almost certainly not what the person who wrote this code intended. So there's a Clang Tidy checker, it's called, I think, mismatched parameters, that looks for exactly this case. It looks for function calls with two parameters, and where both parameters require implicit conversions. And then it says, OK, I found that. Now, just as a thought experiment, if I switch the order of the two parameters, does that require no conversions? And if so, it spits out a warning that says, are you sure you meant to do this? Because chances are you didn't. And um, I mention this not because this is an earth-shaking, you know, groundbreaking tool. But these are the kind of things you can do with Clang Tidy, and it's and writing your own checkers in Clang Tidy. You know, you talked up here about how many of these people, many of the people here in the audience are internal developers. You can write internal code checkers as Clang Tidy modules and use them specifically for coding conventions or coding styles that you use in your company. And you don't have to commit Blah. You do not have to push them back to the LLVM organization. You can just have them be internal. And you can, in, you can enforce coding style, and you can enforce coding guidelines. Or you can say, this is a style of bugs, a, a class of bugs we see a lot of. Let's write a checker to find that particular idiom, and we can remove it from our coding base, code base. Okay. That's, that's really the point of this slide, to say this is, this is a simple kind of bug, and you can, you can write Clang Tidy checkers that will find all the instances of this in your code base, and then you can remove them. OK. Dynamic analyzers. Again, great, wonderful tools. Um, uh, I think of dynamic analyzers like um, you have Assertions. Assertions are exactly dynamic analyzers. They, ch they check values of things in your programs and do actions if they don't match certain predicates, right? The default, the default action of an assertion is what? It prints a message to send it out and aborts, which is fine. Um, debug mode. Everybody's you know, program has a debug mode where it does a whole bunch of extra checking and logging and so on. Um, sanitizers. I love the sanitizers. Address sanitizer is a great tool. Um, Kostya and his team at Google uh, wrote this oh, almost 15 years ago now, and eh, 12 years ago, and um, became part of LLVM, and then GCC implemented it, and then um, Microsoft has implemented it as well. How many people are familiar with Address Sanitizer? Ooh, not enough. Okay, Address Sanitizer, all the sanitizers work the same way. You build. You build your program with dash f sanitize equals something, address, for address sanitizer. It affects the code generation of the compiler. In particular, it does things to the memory layout of the, the data in your program. It puts all, your, um, all of your um, allocations in their own memory page, put guard pages on both sides. Um, it, lays out your global variables the same way. And then it, it also instruments your code so that on every memory access it checks to make sure that things are in, in range, in the memory, access, the, um, the memory range that it expects it to be. And then you take this binary that you have built and you exercise it somehow. 
Um, the easiest way to do that is to run your test suite against it. Remember what I said about how the test suite keeps, keeps on giving? It's another example. And then whenever it discovers an out-of-bounds read or an out-of-bounds write, it aborts the program with a nice long list that says, you're reading 14 bytes off the end of this memory block at this position in your program. Here's a stack trace. This block was allocated at this position in your program. Here's a stack trace. And the beautiful thing about it is every time it goes off, you have a bug. There's, there's not really any argument about that. You're, you've got an out-of-bounds read or an out-of-bounds write. You know, you're reading something on the stack from a function that is returned. And it tells you exactly where the memory was allocated. It tells you where the, where the, um, where the access is. And you can go look at it. And frequently, you can look at this thing for 60 seconds and say, oh, I see the problem right there. And you can fix it. But the thing is, is the thing that the, the binary that you built with the sanitizer, you don't ever ship. Because it's, this, this kind of checking is not free. It tends to make your program larger, use more memory, um, run slower. But it's OK, because it's just, a test, it's just a test build. Just like you don't ship your debug mode build to customers, right? OK. Um, any questions about? Address sanitizer or dynamics checkers in general? Yes, down here in front. Sanitizer replace the debug line tool? So uh, the question is does sanitizers replace the Valgrind tool? So, sanitizers are a different approach to the same kind of things that Valgrind finds. Okay, Valgrind has a huge advantage over the sanitizers. Wait, slower. Sorry, S sorry. Let me finish. Valgrind has a huge advantage over address sanitizers, say, in that you do not need to make a custom build of your, of your application to use, to use Valgrind. You can, you can use Valgrind on somebody else's executable. Okay, but the address sanitizer, because it's integrated into the compiler and you get a special build, can be much, much faster. Instead of 20 times slower, it might be twice as slow. And that gives you the ability to attack problems that you couldn't before. Um, so yes, it's a, similar, it's a similar kind of tool. I should have mentioned Valgrind up here. Um, but, um, but yeah, I find that the, the performance difference between address sanitizer or unbehind defined behavior sanitizer and so on, just to be an, um, an amazing win. Any other questions? Fuzzing. Fuzzing was next. Fuzzing. How many people have, have tried fuzzing their programs? A few. A couple. Nobody's really into Everybody's like this. <laughs> anyway, so the, the, the whole point of fuzzing is, and I have a long talk about it. I could talk about fuzzing for an hour, but we won't. Um, the point of fuzzing is that you have a, a program or a procedure that takes a sequence of bytes. Some some kind, or not even a sequence of bytes, some, some set of data. And fuzzing, well, what a fuzzing framework will do will take random data and send it to, to your application or your, your routine and monitor the results. And that doesn't sound very promising, but the smart fuzzers like libfuzzer or AFL or so on, they, they work they combine with code coverage tools. And so what they do is they send some data to you and, and then look and see what paths in your code have been exercised. And then modify the data, permute the data, and try again and see if they, this does any other, um, exercise any other paths. And eventually, they will exercise all of the paths through your, your code. Um, and this is great. One of the early examples with AFL Somebody, somebody took a JPEG file reader and turned it, turned AFL. Um, AFL, American Fuzzy Lop, is the name of a breed of rabbit. Somebody was being cute. Rabbits are fuzzy. This is a fuzzer. OK, fine. Um, anyway, and they said, let's run this over and over again and, and just let it go for like four days. And at the end of the four days, 
AFL was sending it valid JPEG files as inputs because it had you know, started with like a single byte file. And oh, it said that's not a valid JPEG file. And again and again and again and again. And eventually hit the, with the first byte being FF, I think it was. And then it said, it said, oh, and we go down this path. OK, it's still not a valid JPEG file. But interestingly enough, it was generating syntactically valid JPEG files that were just like nobody, none that nobody had ever seen. They were just crazy, but they were syntactically valid, which was really what the, the people doing the test wanted. Um, OSS Fuzz here is a service that Google puts out called, fuzz, it's called Fuzzing as a Service. If you, have, you are an open source library and you're willing to write the fuzz tests, they will run these for you on their hardware and then send you, send you reports on a regular basis whenever anything fails. This is really handy. You know, somebody else is paying for the CPU time and the storage. Um, on the other hand, if you do this, you will get inputs. If you fuzz your program, you will, you will find that there are inputs that are just, you look at those and say, why would anybody do that? And the answer is, nobody would do that. But still, they fa the, the, the fuzzer has found inputs that your program fails on. Um, by the way, address sanitizer and fuzzing are a great combination. Because address, if you, fuzzing tends to, find corner cases where you don't check things really well, and you might have out-of-bound reads and writes. And you know, sometimes those are harmless. They, they go out and poke something that isn't vital, <laughs> and you never notice it. But address sanitizer will take those failures and make them deterministic. And so your program will be running along, and then bam, you have a failure. And look, you have an out-of-bounds write, or an out-of-bounds read, or you know, a use after free, or something like that. Anyway, yes? So um, the question is, do I use the fuzzer to test um, things like the STL that have algorithms, or do you see, use things that, uh, that test that like read files like a JSON or a JPEG file? Um, more of the latter, I have used fuzzing to test various bits of the STL, in particular things that have parsers in them, um, regex, for example. And um, you know, and f format FMT or printf or you know, scanf and things like that, things that have parsers in them. You want to make sure that your parsers are in fact bulletproof because people attack those. Um, funny story. Um, I was the OSS fuzz people sent me a uh, a test for because you know said oh look I have this regex which causes a crash. I said, OK, let's look at this regex. And I looked at this regex. I like shaking my head, oh, dear. And I, I tweeted out to, to a couple of friends of mine, I just got a bug report that said this regex crashes you know, libc++'s regex parser. This regex is 546k bytes long. My friend Michael Case tweeted back to me, said, I used to think it would be cool to be you. <laughs> it took me all day of kind of divide and conquering, but I got it down to about a 50 byte regex that's had the same crash. And, and from there, it was much easier to figure out what was going on. Anyway, um, if you search for fuzz or lose, all in quotes, you will find a cock from 2017 by Kostya, who's one of the authors of Address Sanitizer. It's a very good talk. I heartily recommend it. If you're not using fuzzing, if you, especially if you have parsers that take input, input from outside your, um, outside your organization, or even just from untrusted sources in general, and you're not fuzzing, you're missing a bet. OK? All right. Let's talk about something completely different. Let's talk about dealing with users. We all have users. At least we all hope we have users, right? 
Okay, what do users do? They do all sorts of things. They ask questions, they make comments, they ask for enhancements, they file bug reports. They make questions, you know, they offer contributions. Sometimes, if you're really lucky, they'll port your stuff to new systems. This is all great. It means that people are using your, your software. This is all great things. Okay, so the question is, what do you do with these things? The first thing you do, thank you, first thing you do is you say thank you to them. Okay, these are people who are, who are invested in your, your library. They, they not only have looked at your library, they've read it, they're trying to use it, they found a problem, and they haven't just said, ah, delete it and go on to the next thing. They're, they're instead t reaching out to you to try to get it fixed. That's a great thing. Say thank you. Um, questions can be answered if you're, if you're really good. Questions can be answered with a link to your documentation. If you don't have um, the right answer in your documentation, consider adding it to your documentation. Um, maybe there's a bug. Okay, and you say, fine, thanks. Um, contributions, you have to uh, you know, talk about that with them. Okay, here's an example. I'm going to start moving a little faster because I just got a note. That I'm running along. I got a bug report for libc++ that says, um, bug report, multi-map clear is missing exceptions. It should be no except, but it's not. So what did I do? I said, thank you. <laughs> I checked, do we have a test for that? No, we didn't. So I wrote a test. I watched it fail. I add no except, run the test again, watch them pass. Check it in the, fi check in the fix and the new test. It's all good. I am not a fan of the full-on test-driven development thing where you write a test and then you write some new code and write a new test and write new code. Um, that's, that is not something I subscribe to. But in cases of bug reports, the very first thing I do is I write a test that exercises the bug. If I can't get the, if I can't write a test to exercise it, how do I know if I fixed it? Um, actually, interesting enough, step two was quite a bit more involved than that. I said, I said, do we have a test to see that clear is no except for any of the other containers for set, for multi-set, for unordered, um, for map? No. So I ended up adding, adding tests for all of those, and it turned out that DEC clear had no tests at all. So I ended up actually putting in a lot of tests, but that's neither here nor there. Um, Howard Hinnett, people have talked about Howard Hinnett here at this conference. Howard's a great guy. Um, he has a date library that he wrote. It's in use in lots of places. And he, um, he in fact, eventually we standardized that as, as STD chrono. Um, but he has a type in there called a day, and it's a thin wrapper around a short, right? 1 to 31, fine. Um, and originally it had no constructor. It had no default constructor. Because what's the use of a day with an indeterminate value? But it turns out that people kept asking him for it, and he asked, talked to them and tried to figure out why. It's because they wanted to do things like this. They wanted to declare a day and then read it, read it in from a string, because he supported I, did I.O. support. They also wanted to put days or weekdays or in, some other, in a vector. And you can't do that if it's not default constructible. And they want to be able, because these were just thin wrappers around it, so they want to be able to save them out to a file and then read them in from a file, because they are trivially constructible. So eventually he, um, he added this. You know, listen to your users. They, they will use your library in ways you don't know. They have, they have different. Um, they have different needs than you think, right? OK. We'll speed up a little bit here. OK. Uh, do you have releases? Do you expect your users to just live at head, live at whatever you've checked in that day? Do you have explicit releases? You should, if, you, if you have more than a couple users, you should consider having releases, th things that are stable, things that are stable for some period of time, a few months, six months, whatever. Boost releases four times a year, excuse me, three times a year. Um, part of that is also what goes into release? An announcement. Five minutes, got it. An announcement, um, some notes. What's changed from the last time? Um, the beauty of this is you, know, you can look at your change log and write these up. But this is also a way of telling people, this is why you want this release. And a method for attaining the release. Okay, 
I'm ro rolling right along here. Um, release notes, it's amazing how many bad release notes there are in the world. So it's not really hard to do better than that. Okay. Person who asked earlier about future plans, this is not, the release notes are not a bad place to put future plans. Um, and if you have regular releases, you, know, you can update them every time you do release. This is what I'm thinking of doing in the next release. Those are not commitments unless you say definitely, yes, this is going to, but this, you say, these are the ideas I have for the next release. Okay. Um, last thing here, managing change. Um, yeah. As, you're, as, you're, as your user base grows, or uh, in other words, as you understand the needs of your users better, you will realize that some of the, change, the decisions you made early on were not the best. Okay? And you want to make changes to your library, breaking changes. You know, internal only changes, nobody cares, right? But um, breaking changes, externally visible changes, are tough because it requ requires you to do things in, requires, doesn't require you to do, requires changes in both your library code and user's code. Now, if you have five users, this is not really a problem. You tell them, you've got to change this. If you have 500 users, that's harder. If you have 5,000 users, 500,000 users? Goo. Anyway, and the other thing is, is it's misleading because you see the benefits, they're clear to you. They're in your library code. And the costs are not. The costs are born somewhere else. Um, and that's, that's hard. So this, this is some place where it's, you know, as your user base grows, you have to be really um, careful. What are your options? Make changes, well, make changes when the benefit is compelling, yes. Add documentation. You know, provide, you can provide the old and the new ways for a while and say, this one's going away. Um, you can do example conversions. Um, if you're really, really, you know, if you're part of a big team and you have lots of user base, user, a large user base, excuse me, you could do things like, you know, automated tools to help people with the, with the conversions. Um, Google promised that for a while with Absale. I don't know if they're still promising that. Um, anyway. Automated code conversion tool, right? So conclusions. We'll wrap this up, and then I'll go for questions. Um, good documentation can help attract new users and actually lower the, the maintenance burden for existing users on you, because you can point to the documentation. Point to the documentation. You don't want to say, oh, you stupid person. Why didn't you read the documentation? You just say, no, I covered this here. <laughs> um, tests can keep your code quality high. Oh, yeah, love tests. Um, there are a lot of tools out there today that there weren't 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, you should, it's well worth your while to investigate it. There's a whole um, foyer of people wanting to have you use their tools. Some of them are really good. Um, listen to your users, keep, treat them kindly because, um, because they're trying to help you. They want you to succeed. And take field experience into account. You know, your users will give you field experience. Find out you know, what they're doing and why they're doing it. OK. And tell them what you've done. And we're done. And yeah, and the time's up. OK, thank you very much. I wish I, wish I could claim that I had timed that just exactly right. But that's, that's just luck. Questions. Questions, questions. Way back there. Um, a lot of mo modern template based, heavy, heavy, heavy based libraries, almost libraries, are, are designed to not compile and use them all instead of just not working. Yes. How do you make tests that won't compile when a test is still coming up to Um So. Writing tests that won't compile, you know, that, that where a success is not compiling is easy and then kind of hard. And I, I'll explain. Writing a test and just checking that a certain thing will not compile, that's easy. But writing something that, testing that the com compilation failed for the right reasons is hard. 
you know, you could write a test that you expect it not to compile and leave a semicolon off, and it will fail to compile, but not for the reason you wanted to test. In libc++, what we did was we would capture the compiler error messages and look for particular error messages, but that only works with one compiler. We were, we were co concentrating on Clang for those kind of tests. And that works really, really well for Clang. But GCC generates completely different error messages. And the Microsoft compiler different, generates very different error messages. And so the, the matching of the compiler output did not help, does not do that. But the idea of, of having test cases that should fail to compile is a good one. Anybody else? Yes, over there. Uh, my question is, are there any tools that allow to see the examples in consistency with the actual uh, to make things? When you make the change, example, it will test your example that it still works. OK, so the question is? And there is a, a very such a system right. in Fargo. It has a mm -hmm. Um, so the question is, are there tools that can, broadly speaking, extract the examples out of your documentation and, and make sure that they still work? Um, I'm sure there are. I don't know of any. I have written some of those for my own use, um, but I don't know of a, just a general purpose one of those. Um, certainly you can do things with, you know, just extract markup, out, you know, you know, put a mark at the beginning of the example, extract that, and compile, and you can automate that. But I would love to have a tool that did that, and I suspect there are them out. Are there is one out there, or more more than one? I just don't know what they are. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Right here in front. Um, sometimes the code that you write also interacts with the operating system in which you're running. So mm -hmm. you compile the registry, executing whatever. Mm -hmm. How do you test that, like in a way that's Oh, so things like um, things like testing that you you create a file and make sure that that works, and you want to be able to make sure that the the file gets created in the right place and then gets cleaned up afterwards because you want to be able to run the tests again. Um, what we did in libc++ is we would basically do a ch root thing on Unix systems where we would have a directory that we created and do all those things in there. And then at the end of that, we would just blow that directory away. Um, but that's, that is a harder problem, especially when you start doing things with various permissions. Right? You want to test, for example, I want to create a file. OK, I can test that. Right? I want to change the owner of the file. OK, I can test that. Now, OK, I want to clean up afterwards. I want to delete the file. Oh, you don't have permissions to delete that file. Um, so, yeah, that's, that, is, that requires more care. It's definitely doable, but it's not as simple as just, you know, make a call, look at the results. Okay. 